Okay, back for more, I see. All right, I love it. We are um, really getting there with the story of Omer Madison Kem, populist congressman from Nebraska, my great-great-grandfather, and my political inspiration, i got to admit. There's his story, which is the master's thesis written by Deloitte John Guth, scholar at the University of Manitoba School of Law. He wrote this as his master's thesis for his history degree, master's in history in Creighton University, way back in 1960, 1963. And um, so we have been reading the story, and we're now on chapter five. So without further ado, Let's proceed with the story of Omer Madison Kem, the People's Congressman, written by Deloitte John Guth and narrated by yours truly, Chris Christensen, great-great-grandson of Omer Madison Kem. And chapter 5 is entitled, The Saga of a Successful Failure. Well, Congressman Omer Madison Kem had won a popular mandate in the election of 1892. He increasingly found, after his return to Washington, that he was suffering more than the contumely customarily reserved for junior members of the House of Representatives. Isolated on committees of only nominal importance, Kem would face for the first time in his short career as a politician a situation where his voice won no acceptance. His shouts for agrarian reform, when allowed, would merely echo through the halls in meaningless cacophony. Like prairie whirlwinds, Kem and the handful of congressional populists could howl but could succeed only in raising a little dust. The Republican sun had shone too long and in too many of the right places to permit a few gusty speeches to bring relief for the farmer's economic and political drought. Even in the face of worsening financial conditions throughout the country, Omer Kem's voice would evoke only growing derision from the conservatives controlling Congress. The lines of battle over the financial issue had been well defined in Kem's first session in the Congress, but victory for the Silverites seemed imminent with the election of Cleveland in 1892. Kem, however, soon learned otherwise, for even though the new president had been elected on a democratic platform calling for tariff revision and the status quo on the financial question, Cleveland had quickly called a special session of Congress which would convene on August 7, 1893, to destroy the Sherman Silver Purchase Act of 1890. A financial panic in the spring of 1893, which quickly became a major depression, was the immediate cause of Cleveland's attempt to restore business confidence by curbing further inflation. This breach of faith with the Westerners, as Kem saw it, merely proved again that the vested interests could wear both Democratic and Republican robes over their solid gold vests. Even though Cleveland's anti-silver purpose had been made clear, Kem and the other Westerners approached the special session with high hopes. For them, the free coinage of silver meant an enlarged currency and therefore the provision of a panacea for the debt-ridden Western farmers. <clears throat> Kim and his fellow silverites welcomed the opportunity for which they had long called to place their issue squarely before the people. On August 11, 1893, the Democratic administration introduced its bill calling for the repeal of the Sherman Act of 1890. Congressman Kem immediately supported the time limit placed on debate as proposed by Congressman Richard Silver Dick Bland of Missouri. During the debate on the administration's proposal, the Silverites hoped to ram through its antithesis. And from that point on, the House of Representatives began a furious debate. <clears throat> on August 24th, during an evening meeting of the Silver Session, the fiery red-headed populist member from Nebraska with a torch-like tongue to match took to the floor in what would be the apogee of his entire congressional career. The Honorable Omer Madison Kem first noted the fact that those who had sneeringly referred to the populists as cranks were now howling the loudest. All of the wrath and venom in his muscular body poured out in masterful invectives hurled at the merchants, trusts, British bondholders, banking corporations, and the betrayers of the people's confidence who now resided in Washington. 
After damning the money mongers of the East, Kim dug in his populous heels and thundered, For others I cannot speak, but for myself, live or die, sink or swim, survive or perish, I am for free coinage, sixteen to one, and am willing to stay here till it is secured or my term in Congress expires. The vicious attack reflected all of the hate which Congressman Kim could conjure up, and he knew full well that it had been warranted. He did not have to look far for justification of his wrath. His home state was on the verge of total financial collapse, with the Capital National Bank of Lincoln leading the way in January amid a disclosure of a sordid connection between bank speculation and state government. In all, 21 state banks with a capital of $22,400,000 failed in Nebraska in 1893, giving Kim part of the raison d'etre for his verbal onslaught. <clears throat> Following Kim's powerful indictment of the repeal bill and its sponsors, he cast his vote for an amendment providing for free coinage of silver at the ratio of 16 to 1, the conservative Republicans and administration supporting Democrats fought back with frequent demands for quorum calls, quorum roll calls, during which they sat silently in their seats. After the parliamentary maneuvering, the House voted down the amendment. Compromising Silverites next offered four amendments, which progressively devalued the ratio of silver to gold to as low as 20 to 1. But Kem either abstained or voted against these last-ditch attempts. On August 28, 1893, the vote came for the repeal of the clause requiring the purchase of silver, and it easily carried. Kem cast his ballot against repeal, but the conservative Eastern Democrat-Republican coalition handily sunk the silver ship of state with Kem still inside it. Though Kim's hope of financial reform was all but lost, Nebraska's only avowed populist congressman still remained on the offensive. Undaunted by what he deemed to be Cleveland's blatant perfidy on the money question, Kim and the Westerners decided to test the administration on its promise of tariff reform. When the issue came to the floor of the House, the defeated Silverites made an immediate move to add a provision for a graduated income tax. Once again, Cleveland's conservative friends reacted apprehensively, attacking the anarchists and crying for a halt to the communist march. But with Bryan in the lead and Kim not far behind, the Westerners made it clear that the income tax writer was a part and parcel of the Wilson-Gorman tariff bill and that if the conservative Eastern Democrats wanted to save their public face through tariff revision, they would have to take all or nothing. On January 31, 1894, Congressman Kem took to the House floor once again, this time to aid in cramming the income tax amendment down the president's throat. He pointed out that the income tax would restore the public financial burden to that class of citizens which had escaped it to the extent of $640 million. To back this statement up, Kem then introduced four pages of statistical data into the congressional record, taking pains to point out that the provision for the graduated income tax had been first publicly demanded in the populist's Omaha platform. In the end, the Wilson-Gorman tariff with the income tax rider passed and became law without Cleveland's signature. But Kem soon had further evidence to support his conspiracy charges. In 1895, a conservative-dominated Supreme Court disregarded its previous approval of the Civil War income tax and declared unconstitutional the new levy on incomes. Congressman Kem and his Western colleagues had won a momentary victory, but had lost the war for reform. Disappointed by his defeat on the silver and tax issues, Omar Kem later charged in a personal challenge from his seat in the rear of the House chamber that the Republican Party is responsible for enacting the laws which destroy the money of the people, and the Democratic Party is responsible by its administration for carrying out those laws to the very letter. He had lost faith in both political parties, and they had long ago relegated him to the status of oblivion. Both parties quarantined Kem for the reform-ridden plague which he bore, and only the western segment of the Democratic Party sympathized in the least with his efforts. 
Thus, while Congressman Kemp could boast of seeing his constituents rightly represented, he had to face the fact of the futility of his crusade for agrarianism. Nevertheless, while Kemp could not win fights for his constituents, he did seek to render them exemplary service in the he did seek to render them exemplary service in the performance of his routine duties. He attended practically every sitting of the Congress, and during the battles of the Silver Session and the subsequent efforts for tariff reform, he held a record of attendance which among those of Nebraska's six members was second only to that of Bryan. Moreover, he had done so during a period of excessive congressional absenteeism. On only one occasion did the House issue a warrant to summon him to his seat, and that was in the closing weeks of his third and final term in office when he had completely given up his political career. On the matter of petitions from citizens and groups in his district, Kem faithfully entered every one in the congressional record and used them repeatedly as proof positive of the popular support he had for his political decisions. When at home in Nebraska, Omer Madison Kemp also strove to merit the title of the People's Congressman. He made himself readily available to receive the people's petitions and letters and maintained an open door to the office he had constructed in his home in Broken Bow. Kemp's actions in Congress drew various reactions from the newspapers back in Nebraska. The Alliance populist press generally clung to Kemp since he consistently acted in support of its principles. In the words of one editor, it glorified his grit. Or, excuse me, it gloried in his grit, trumpeting the fact that Kem had never faltered in his battle against plutocracy. Moreover, Kem's position as the personified antithesis of the Republican Party brought him sympathy publicly from the several Democratic newspapers in the state. As their leading journal put it, Kim was the most conscientious member of Congress and had become well known to Nebraskans for his firm and courageous and faithful devotion to duty. <clears throat> At the same time, the Republican press continued its personal attacks on Kim, calling him everything from that red-headed rooster to a non-entity and a pick a -roon. What pleased the Western farmers became anathema to the Republicans, and what was a matter of principle to Omer Madison Kemp had become the subject of ridicule to the quote-unquote old guard of Nebraska politics. Kem simply took these attacks as indicative of the fear aroused by his noble crusade, ignoring the smears and stooping to reply on only one occasion. On October 17, 1893, Congressman Kim answered the charges made by the Omaha Daily Bee in a short speech made on the floor of the House. The hostile assertion was that he and Bryan had not supported a certain bill for the benefit of Nebraska. Kim simply pointed out to Edward Rosewater, the Bee's editor, that neither he nor Bryan had been members of the 51st Congress which had considered the proposal, and, he jibed, if anyone should be blamed by the Republican press, it had to be the Republican delegation that represented Nebraska at that time. Oh, neither attacks nor applause unduly affected Kem's realistic assessment of his political prospects. What little progress his crusade had made in Washington had been with the aid of Bryan and the Western Democrats. Kem saw little chance to gain further reform under the political status quo, for two terms in Congress had shown him that success required more than personal dedication and sectional shibboleths. As a populist, Kem soon realized that he could not obtain reform by bucking the tiger alone. As he later recalled, the Democrats, by 1894, had stole enough of our populist thunder to check our growth, while the Republicans had managed to hang on in the face of growing opposition from the Westerners. As a result, he became convinced that only through continued cooperation with the Western Democrats could he achieve the reforms desired by the populists, and at the same time such cooperation had become necessary in order for Kemp to protect his political life against the Republican resurgence in Nebraska. 
When convention time arrived in 1894, Congressman Kim found himself caught between the diminishing political strength of his own party and a revitalized Republican opposition. As early as 1892, his populist colleague in the House, William McKeegan, had been forced to run as a populist Democrat fusionist. In that same election, the Republicans had been able to recapture the control of the state legislature, even though a coalition of Democrats and populists could defeat them. Thus, by 1894, Omar Kham had developed serious doubts about running for a third term on the populist ticket. He did not attend the populist congressional convention in the 6th district, even though it was held in Broken Bow during a congressional recess. Nevertheless, Cam received the nomination, but not until a rival candidate, William Green, had openly canvassed the delegates on his own behalf. For the first time, Omar Kemp did not receive his populist nomination by acclamation and without opposition. He accepted the opportunity for a third time, but did so with an announcement that he would campaign as a fusionist and populist. One month later, on September 24th, the Democrats met at Broken Bow for their congressional convention and cleared the way for an endorsement of Congressional Kem, of Congressman Kem, by turning the decision over to a five-man committee. This group was to decide between nominating a Democratic candidate or endorsing Kem. The chairman of this committee sent his personal assurances to Brian that we will formally nominate him, Kem, as soon as the proper papers can be arranged. Eleven days later, the committee completely endorsed Omar Kem for a third term in Congress, thus consummating the bid for fusion which Kem had made after his populist nomination. As Kem saw it, the Democrats, who had little strength in western Nebraska, had fused behind him as a moderate populist. The immediate goal for both parties, as announced in the Democratic press, was to defeat the Republicans, and in the 6th District, Congressman Kem was the most likely man to do the job. The ensuing campaign was Kem's final battle in Nebraska politics, and he applied himself with his usual vigor. Thanks to Kemp's commitment to fusion, his only opponent of note was the Republican nominee Matthew Dougherty. Kemp debated with Dougherty in public meetings held throughout the 6th District. Kemp's opponent imparted a certain note of confusion to the debates and to the campaign in general by supporting the free coinage of silver at a ratio of 16 to 1. As a Republican, he evidently knew that he would fast become a political corpse unless he could meet Kem head-on over the issue of financial reform. Yet, despite Dougherty's desperate tactic, Kem kept the loyalty of the farmers. He clashed with his opponent on the financial issue and soundedly attacked him for Republican protectionism on the question of the tariff. Kim had the support of the state organ of the Alliance Populist Movement, which went so far as to publish a full-page eulogy and summary of Congressman Kim's career in Washington, and once more he presided over Alliance picnics held in his honor. Near the close of the campaign, he participated in a day-long tribute to him given by the people of his own Custer County. Best of all for Kim, he received a comfortable majority on Election Day, obtaining 17,077 votes to the 14,676 votes cast for his Republican opponent. Omar Kim won only one more county than did Dougherty, but he ran so well throughout the 6th district that he did not lose a single county by more than 90 votes. But even though victorious for the third straight time, Congressman Kim soon had a new political problem to face. In the aftermath of the election of 1894, a political feud arose in which Omar Kem lost much of his political control in his home county. In the early summer of 1895, an anti-Kem faction gained control of the Custer County Alliance populist machinery and nominated its members for the county positions to be filled in November of 1895. Omar Madison Kem had not only protested the action, but he actively campaigned for several weeks in the fall against two of the men nominated. One of the men he opposed was William Green, the candidate for county judge and the man who had unsuccessfully tried for the nomination to Kem's seat in Congress in 1894. In the end, his opponent won out. His, in the end, his opponents won out, leaving Kem and his supporters out in the political cold. 
an alliance rally held in Broken Bow to ratify the election victory passed resolutions condemning Kem's betrayal and declared that the Custer County Party could no longer be held responsible for his official acts. Thus, Kem had a glaring political reality staring him in the face, providing one more reason for him to ponder his political future with misgivings. Nevertheless, Congressman Kem continued to assert his righteousness in having opposed his own party's candidates. He claimed that his opponents had sought public office only for personal aggrandizement, and for the first and only time, the local Republican press wholeheartedly supported Kem and complimented him for his conscientious convictions to duty. <clears throat> In his reply to the Custer County resolutions, Kem defended his actions as the true position necessary to maintain sacred populist principles. Furthermore, if being a good populist meant stultifying myself by supporting men for office whom I know are not fit for it, then I do not want to be a populist in good standing. He proudly declared, I would rather be right than the chief of any party. But although the local group ultimately dropped its assertions and gave its congressional nominal support, and gave its congressman the nominal, nominal support, Kem's feud marked the end of agrarian unity in his behalf. He had characterized his opponents as opportunists who hid behind the guise of populist principles, but he himself had become vulnerable to criticism for his fusion with one of the despised old parties. Kem's growing political weakness may well have been important in his decision to quit politics. Of all of the reasons Kem might have had for retiring from public life, the one which he later emphasized was purely personal. Six years in Congress had meant an almost complete alienation from his growing family. Kem's children, by his first marriage, had grown into their teens with little chance for fatherly care, and he soon found that he had to get acquainted over again on each of his returns from Washington. Since 1889, he had added three daughters to the family of four children, which he had left in the care of his second wife when the call had come for political action. Kem's wife, Allie, had visited him in Washington for short stays in 1892 and again in 1894, but he had not had enough money to move the whole family from their home in Broken Bow to the nation's capital. Not until February 1st, 1894, had Kem finally paid off his $1,550 mortgage on the original homestead, which he continued to rent out on shares. Even though his position in Congress had brought him financial solvency, it had done so at the cost of interminable, lonely stays away from his family. Thus, by 1895, Congressman Kemp had already decided to withdraw completely from Nebraska politics and had fixed upon a new site for his home. While serving in Congress, Kemp had met Judge John Bell, a Democratic congressman from Colorado, from whom he had learned of several opportunities in Bell's home county. As a result, during the summer of 1895, Omar Kem and his 13-year-old son, Claude, had packed their gear for a 400-mile journey to Montrose, Colorado. They had traveled with two other men in Kem's horse-drawn wagon and had camped out by night. Kem had taken a survey of the country as soon as they arrived at the home of Judge Bell and had decided that it would be a perfect place to resume his agrarian vocation. He had bought a 160-acre farm which had been abandoned because of several mortgages, but which had over 100 fruit-bearing trees on it. Kim had paid $15 per acre, or $2,400, which was the total amount of the mortgages. He had been unable, however, to take personal possession until the end of the 54th Congress, so he had therefore rented out his new farm until the summer of 1897. By the end of 1895, then, Omer Madison Kem had definitely committed himself to a quiet exit from Nebraska and from his short but colorful political career. With all of his personal plans made, Congressman Kem returned to the political battle in Washington. 
In the 54th Congress, Kem had to play his role as a ridiculed reformer in the face of a Republican resurgence. He was the only non-Republican out of the six representatives elected from Nebraska in 1894, and with the return to the speakership of Thomas Brackett, Czar Reed of Maine, the Honorable Omer Madison Kem fell under a subtly imposed ban which prevented any of the eight populists from gaining the Speaker's rostrum. He had had enough trouble escaping anonymity under the Democrat Speaker Charles Crisp of Georgia and once had had to threaten Crisp openly with the prospect of having all unanimous consent legislation blocked until Kem would be recognized to present his own bill. But now the gag rule imposed by Reed proved to be the final blow. On December 28, 1895, Kem vehemently damned the Republicans for refusing representation to his Nebraska constituents by the restriction. The speech appeared in the appendix of the congressional record, never having been allowed to reach the floor. Hence, Kem's last term would be a political nightmare. In addition to the Reed gag, Congressman Kim and the other populists suffered from the loss of former leaders. Tom Watson had long ago succumbed to concerted efforts employed against him in the election of 1892. Then in 1894, Kim's ally and sympathizer from his home state, William Denny Bryan, had read the handwriting on the wall and had retired to the front offices of the Omaha World Herald. Besides the resurgent Republicans, Bryan had also faced the hostility of the Cleveland administration as a result of his role in the passage of the Wilson-Gorman tariff. The man who had retaken control of the state's Democratic Party from Bryan's admirers in the summer of 1893 had been Cleveland's Secretary of Agriculture, J. Sterling Morton of Nebraska City. For Kim, the entire story of the demise of Watson and Bryan fitted neatly into his belief in the conspiracy ruling Washington. He and the remainder of the populist faction in Congress became political wanderers, with every man a self-designated leader. Kim regularly nominated the unsuccessful populist candidates for Speaker of the House, but he never really assumed political leadership of the rebel reformers. In the final analysis, Congressman Kim became a political independent, both by choice and by virtue of the reality of his situation. Nevertheless, Omer Kim possessed too much metal to give up his fight in the face of almost insurmountable obstacles. Instead, he waged a vigorous counterattack throughout the 54th Congress, becoming a one-man thorn in the side as far as the ruling Republicans were concerned. When on February 11, 1896, a bill reached the floor of the House which would have regulated the practice of medicine and surgery, Kim lodged an objection to any proposition that tends to monopolize the art of healing. The House erupted with numerous questions asking Kim to analyze the competence of hair doctors, corn doctors, and faith healers, but Kim stuck to his guns, declaring that the results of the medical egotists could be found in every graveyard in this country. He paralleled the situation with that of the theological egotists who were too dogmatic to tolerate any and all views towards religion. Kim built a surprisingly concise case against what appeared to be a nonpartisan proposal and succeeded in delaying passage for several days. But as to the religious analogy which he drew, Kim clearly sought to defend his own fascination for spiritualism. But if that instance had not been enough to show the House that he could play its game of obstructionism, Kim certainly made the point in the next few months. From March through May of 1896, the House met every Friday evening to revise and increase the military pension program. Congressman Kim faithfully attended every session with the avowed intention of imposing his own hierarchy of values In determining the amount of each pension. He failed to see any reason why an officer or his survivors should receive a larger pension than any army private, especially in view of Kim's belief that the latter had suffered greater privations and risk to his life. Iconic, classic, and rebellious as his opinion might appear, it nevertheless cast him well in the role of a radical obstructionist. In the end, what had begun as a mere formality for the House members ended up as an ordeal filled with steady objections from the red-headed sodbuster seated in the rear of the chamber. 
the populist press back in Nebraska, in answer to Republican charges of obstructionism, responded with a rousing cheer and the advice to just stay, just stay right at him, Kim. He certainly did not win any friends in the House by his dilatory tactics, but by 1896, Congressman Omer Madison Kim had little desire or purpose for so doing. His three terms in Congress were dragging to an ineffectual end. While Kem had tried hard to win political and economic salvation for his fellow agrarians, he had never had the support of a substantial populist bloc in Congress. His party had suffered badly as early as the elections of 1892 and 1894 when the Republican reaction to agrarian radicalism had made itself felt at the polls. The fact that he had found it necessary to run as a fusionist in 1894 rather than a completely independent populist as in the past, merely highlighted the already existing political breakdown of his cause. Moreover, the dissension in Custer County in 1895 had given warning of even greater political trouble. In 1896, Kem did not seek re-election. He closed his Nebraska political career by supporting his free silver colleague, William Jennings Bryant, who was the presidential candidate of both the Democratic and Populist parties. The latter organization did not long survive the strain of fusing with the Democrats to back Bryan, especially in view of the Nebraskans' defeat. As an individual, Cam had helped forge and advance the short-lived populist movement, and in the American tradition of third-party movements, his party had served its purpose by popularizing its demands. Cam's political career had been tied to populist principles and not necessarily to the party itself. He had thus helped to create and destroy the Nebraska Populist Party, first by actively participating in the drive to turn the Farmers Alliance into a political weapon, and then later by his insistence on fusion with the Western Democrats as the only means for implementing reform. In actuality, the story of his political career coincided with the rise and fall of Nebraska populism. Yet, even if his personal crusade had failed, Kim would live to see almost all of the principles for which he had fought enacted eventually into law. For Kim personally, his three terms in Congress had brought previously unknown financial solvency. He had been able to clear away his debts, to support his family in a respectable fashion, and to purchase a new farm in Colorado when the chance presented itself all thanks to the $30,000 plus expenses earned as a farmer's advocate in Congress. In addition, he had practiced a little last-minute nepotism by taking his daughter Maud to the 54th Congress as his first and only secretary. On July 22, 1896, as a financial preparation for his departure from Nebraska, Congressman Kemp had sold his original homestead for $1,200. That summer, he had also returned to Montrose, Colorado, taking a Custer County carpenter with him. They had built a 13-room brick-and-frame home on the farm at a cost to Kem of over $5,000. Kem then returned for the second and final session of the 54th Congress and left Washington forever in March of 1897. On May 24th of that year, Kem sold his house and land in Broken Bow for $1,250 and prepared for the third and final trip from Nebraska to Colorado. In June, after his children finished at school, he took his wife, seven children, and mother-in-law to their new home near Montrose. The Nebraska that he left behind had brought him disillusionment and realization, debt, and solvency, obscurity and respectability, and failure and success. Omer Madison Kim would never return, choosing rather to pick up once again his family traditions and follow the setting sun. All right, so that's the end of uh, Omer Madison Kim, the People's Congressman, Chapter 5. That's not the end of the story. There's one more chapter left. You want to know what happened, how we got to Oregon, right? Well, stick around for Chapter 6, which is going to be coming up next. But thank you very much for sticking around for this chapter. Again, we were listening to or reading Omer Madison Kim, 
the People's Congressman by Deloitte's John Guth. Omar Madison Kem was my great-great-grandfather, populist U.S. Congressman from Nebraska. And as we're learning, his next chapter is going to be in Colorado. So let's see what happens there. And uh, stay tuned for the next video. Don't forget to like and subscribe our video and our um, series on Omer Madison Kim, and you'll hear some great firsthand stories that have never been told about Americans' history. All right, thanks for watching.